by the way, Grisha in uh, Russian is like the diminutive form of Gregory. So it's like all of the mages are called Greg. Greg. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> it's just really funny. <laughs> Hey, welcome to another episode of Unresolved Textual Tension. I am here, my name is Katie, and I am here with one co-host, and his name is... William. And um, <laughs> what's my title around here? How, what's my description? Oh my god, my why do you call... I'm not the person who says handsome bitches. That is Maria. No, no, I no, am no. not. Two, all three of oh, us. Oh, ruggedly are. handsome. I'm sorry. With my you ruggedly know why I handsome doing co-host... That? Because I would always say the lovely Maria. And I was like, that's a little sexist that only she gets her, her looks mentioned. So uh, okay, I had to okay, describe okay. me, but regularly handsome is the best one. Anyway, today we are doing Siege and Storm by Lee Bardugo, which is the second book in the Grisha verse uh, series. It is the sequel to Shadow and Bone, uh, which we read a little bit ago. You can go watch that video in the upper right if I put a card there. Right there. Uh, I mean, there. Yeah, I actually don't remember which way it is. Um, well, it's either way, guys. Either, either, either way, you can find this thing. This is an interesting book to to go over because I watched the second season, um, which uh, uh, adapts this, and then I think a little bit of the or all of the third book um, as well. And I, especially while I was reading this one more than the first book, compared it a lot to the TV show in my brain. Um, you didn't watch the second season, right? I didn't. I um, so for those who didn't watch the other video, I watched. I was dedicated. I got up at like two a.m. the day before uh, or the morning of our recording for it, and I was like, "Well, I haven't watched this yet. I'm kind of sleepless. I'm gonna watch it." Well, I watched it, and I got into about three se uh, not three seasons. Same shame. Uh, I got into about three episodes. And I was like, okay, this is, it's fine, but it's a CW show. So <laughs> I didn't waste my time anymore. No offense to those who like it. If you like it, that's super cool, but it's just not in my wheelhouse. So I was like, nah, we're out. You got to tap out. Yeah. I fully understand that because the show is not great. And it's interesting because just by virtue of being a show, and not a book in terms of the medium, my brain processes it differently. So some of the fantasy tropes here, I'm like, that's a little dumb, but whatever. Whereas on the TV show, they seem so silly. And it's like... What, like the cut? <laughs> <laughs> I did see a lot of uh, scenes with the cut. The cut. Uh, it's such a dumb name for it. Um, I don't and, think so. Uh, I actually like the name for it. It's just... I think it needs an anime name, like Thousand Chittering Birds. Um you mean, are you? I like how you always go back to Sasuke's slash Kakashi's. Well, um, it was Kakashi's first. And then, it was yeah, Shidori. The Chidori. The Chidori. Um, so, yeah. And that was one of the things I noticed is there's a lot of small differences between the show and, and the book. And, like, I actually don't think the show improves as much on the book as the first season did on the book. Um, we'll talk about it because this book Probably has book issues. Stuff. Um, <laughs> you know what it is, I think, is that I talked about this in this, the first book and in um, Ninth House, which uh, Lee Bardugo also, Bardugo also wrote. I still cannot believe that they are the same. Off I mean, I get no, I can't. I can see how this is like the seedlings and how the that's like the stem of her work and that we're yet to await the budding flower of the perfect <gasps> product. Well, that's that's what I was going to say, which is that she gets away with a lot because she's a very talented writer. Her descriptions are really nice. She um, There's a really good interiority to her characters and how they think about things. Um, I did like Alina, even though like she's kind of a weird, like whiny character. Um, but I did find myself on her side a lot. I did too. I will say that. I always found myself on her side for the most, except, except at the beginning of this book. And she gets away with a lot of that, even though as a character, Alina is annoyingly passive. The main conflict of this book is like her just pining after the male character, Mal. Like oh there's God. no real like character arc. Oh, or... That's all this book is, is her and Mal going back and forth about how they don't agree with each other's morals or they don't agree with each other's choices. And so I was listening to uh, Siege and Storm on audiobook. Uh, while driving uh, a long ways uh, at the same time as Guards Guards, which is another book we did by um, 
Uh, Terry Pratchett. Thank you. Uh, and we already did that video. You can go check it out. Um, but after that, I listened to Siege and Storm. And I had a eight hour drive and I was into the drive by four hours and I had been into the book by two hours and I wanted to drive straight into a tree. I, <laughs> I mean it. I, I was just so bored. I was so bored by what was happening. I mean, again, the writing's fine. The writing's great. I mean, she just is obsessed with Mal and Alina. And it's just, it hurts the book so much. I could not stand listening to the first three-fourths. The only part I enjoyed was the very last chapter, pretty much, where, um, you know, like the big climax stuff happens. And so there's actually stuff happening. Everything else, all the characters, everyone's annoying. No one gives any great scenes. There's uh, there are very few scenes. I, I mean, I could literally maybe count on my hand the amount of scenes that touched me. And this is a big book. Yeah, it is. And there were scenes that did it, which is weird. Again, she gets away because she has a lot of skill with descriptions and similes. I know what those are now. Thank you. Um, that's been a, a three video arc now. As um, well as fewer versus less. You can check out the thumbnail for uh, us editing the Savior's uh, Champion if you're curious about what we're talking about. But um, we've read so many bad books, and this is not a good book, but it is not a bad book in the I way know. that other books were. Like, um, you didn't read it, but A Million to One, that was such a bad book. Uh, the Cyborg Tinkerer, such a bad book. Read that. Even, <laughs> even like... Um, mediocre books we've read like uh the wrath and the dawn like this is a this is a cut above them but it's not a cut enough to be good it'll be interesting to talk about i think because the book does so many things poorly but it isn't a poor book and i'm, I'm gonna have to kind of try to put my finger on it as we talk well okay so in the previous book we met alina starkov who really should be alina starkova but whatever and she is part of a nation called ravka and they basically have like elemental mages which are benders but less cool and in halfway through the country is broken uh just a a rift in the world of darkness filled by the basically harpies. And um, she, in the first book, figured out she was the sun summoner. So she was going to push back the wall. But there's an evil general called the Darkling who has a special move called the Thousand Chittering Birds. Oh, my it? God. No, it is. Not. Also, that is not his like crazy special move. It's an OK move. But that's not why he is like the big baddie. Well, no, but he can cut things with shadow, which doesn't make any sense, but whatever. And um, he actually created the fold. And he was trying to steal her power by putting in an amplifier, which is like a magical animal that you kill and then be, like put into your body. And then you. Yeah. Have yeah. Kind powerful. of like uh, if you ever watched the old cartoon for uh, Transformers, there was a cartoon slash anime where there were many, many Transformers. And if you put the mini Transformer on the big <laughs> Transformer, they leveled up. And so that's essentially what this this thing is. So that's basically the thing. She did the stag. And then in this book, oh, okay. And in the end of that book, she like trapped him in the, the dark fold, I think is what they call it. And the she fold, thought he yeah. was dead. But in this book, he isn't dead. And what happened is that her and her friend Mal, who's basically like the okay, job okay. that she's been after all no. her life. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -mm. Go ahead. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He's the sensitive soul that I, I don't see him as a jock. I see him as a artist who just gets around a lot. And it's like the really sweet artist that you don't expect. Would you not be a baby? Um, the sweet <laughs> artist that like gets all the ladies. And this whole time she's like, but I knew he was a sweet artist the whole time. And I knew his art was good the whole time. And now everyone thinks his art is good. And, and it's not art. He's not an artist. But the point is, it's a it's a, it's a metaphor. A sensitive soul. I don't know. I, I Part of it is that the voice actress does like a very like, Alina, I love you voice. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. No, his voice time. is awful. So it's like it's very hard to take him seriously. Um, and this book is all about her pining about over him and him being pissy about it. And it's Ugh. really annoying. No, it okay. It doesn't make any sense to me. Look, this is this is my thesis for why their relationship doesn't work for me. Okay. Uh, even though there's a lot that you could use to build off of it. In the first book, there's a very big turning point. Alina's goal is to run away. 
um, from the Darkling and be hidden and never be seen again or heard from again. And uh, that is what Bagra, the Darkling's mother, suggested she do. Um, she said, you need to run no matter what you do. You're not going to be able to beat him. Um, you're not going to be able to overcome him. You need to go. And Mal was like, bruh, if we're going to do the, the jock thing. Mm -hmm. Bruh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me do the voice. Um, Alina. We <laughs> it is like that. Alina, we got to go find the stag so we can make the necklace for you. And you can have the power and not the darkling. And then Alina's like, oh, my God. I guess that's right. Would you that's enough. Katie has dogs, by the way. And oh this my is Sasha, god, he is being who is, such a baby. God. I love Sasha. He's very intelligent. He's very cunning, you can tell. So Alina says yes, and they go and they go get the stag. Everything goes wrong. Doesn't matter. The point is though, is that Mal was the one that instigated finding more power for her to use so she can fight back against the Darkling. This entire book is him saying, No, don't use your power to fight back against the Darkling. Let's run away and hide. That makes no sense. Okay, so in this book, Mal is very against Alina using her power and getting more power because they're looking for two more amplifiers, um, which will give her power. And I don't know if I missed it, but I never understood why he was against this. Like, he never really states why he's not into it. The most I could gather is that like- He's like, you're changing, Alina. Yeah, and I'm like, and like she does start to change in a very background way, like to like a third of the way towards the end of the book. Um, I liked I the change. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. Her becoming like darker. Um, but the thing is that it's never clear. The, the conflict between them is never clear. And so mostly it just feels like he's being whiny because she's like more important than him now. And she's putting other things before him. I really get that vibe. And yeah. that is not a healthy relationship. Well, and it also just makes him really unlikable. Like in the first book, I was like, okay, he's not my favorite character, but I like him better than the show version. Um, I still don't like the show version. He's so derpy. Um, but in this one, he he just whines a lot and you just don't like him. And it's like, I, I, I kind of wonder to a certain extent if this is a gendered thing a little bit and that if he was a female character, I wouldn't no. be as harsh on him. But I don't know because it's such a drag. Um, no, he's just a drag of a character. In fact, most of the characters in this book are drags. Um, mm -hmm. But he's like the queen of drag. But um, I see what you did there. That was Yeah, clever. thank you. Thank you. He's being um, outlawed in several states. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. He should be, actually. Not the actual drag, but he should be. <laughs> but him um, specifically. Uh, no, Mal's just really annoying. He doesn't... The choices uh, emotionally that he makes, because he makes no choices. Um, but he, he has no agency in this book either, which means he seems really weak also as a male romantic character, or just in general, a romantic character. I mean, look, people don't have to have agency to be a romantic character for your main character, or uh, your romance option, but... It certainly doesn't make them attractive. Yeah, he would be more. It makes them a, a less well-rounded character. And like that's going to be the crux of this book is her and Mal drifting apart. But when I say crux, I mean, there isn't anything more going on on a character level with her in terms of. And this is not a, a metaphor or like, um, uh, you know, it's not like, OK, she's drifting and becoming more a part of the upper class and he feels left behind. And so it's saying something that would be deeper cool, about actually. Her character. Yeah. yeah, it's saying something deeper about her character that him and her are feeling alienated. It's not. It's literally just the book is her being sad and then doing other things that aren't really related to whether he is in love with her or not. Um, now, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that, that was about what I was going to say. Uh, Mal and Alina in this book. Well, I, Alina makes sense. Alina's prioritizing. Alina is like, yo, the world's going to end, essentially, if we allow the Darkling to do this. At least if the world doesn't end, it's going to be really bad regardless. It's because mm -hmm. he doesn't have the right morals. So I have to stand up. It's because I actually do have the power to do this, which she does, unfortunately, apparently. Um, and, uh, she's making those hard decisions. Meanwhile, Mal's having a temper tantrum in the background. Like, I don't want that. Like, I know you need to do that, but I don't want you to do that. I mean, I want to, um, all he, he's like, well, why can't we just run away? Why can't you just be the girl I knew? That is so, that's, he doesn't love her then. He loves the it's idea selfish. of her. 
Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. And he loves her playing into his ego almost is the way it reads. Um, it, yeah. And, <sighs> yeah, it's very annoying, um, especially because she like is now part of a polycule. Uh, no, no, no. What is it? A square triangle or no, it's a square love. It's a love square. A love square. Right. Because we meet a couple new characters. So one of the first changes that I noticed from book to um, uh, show is that in the book, they're basically they're hanging out in hiding in some other town or something. Um, and like we get to see yet again, Mal being attractive and then her being bitchy to women because they it find guys. This is like the most uncomfortable scene, though. There's a lot going on that just makes it seem super emotionally immature, which, uh, again, this is an older book. So maybe. But um, I, I don't know when this was published. But uh, so there's this one. Uh, scene in particular that Will is talking about and it's Alina just got finished from work um, Mal just got finished from work they're meeting up at this fountain and there's a whole bunch of washer women washing their stuff and Mal's there with a friend of his from work and the uh, he <laughs> Mal told his friend that she is a goiter which is why she has a scarf across her neck all the time because that's where the antlers are that she right. has to hide that's the amplifier but anyway, I thought that was actually quite funny. Yeah, but, that was um, funny, yeah. Yes, but then one of the washerwomen, again, in what world does this happen? <laughs> this doesn't happen in a normal world with this setup. You have to give a different setup. But anyway, one of the bosomy washerwomen are like, oh, oh if you want yourself a re <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not doing that right. <sighs> Young lad, if you want yourself a real woman, you can come right over here and um <laughs> and uh you know and he's like nah like and then he like rejoinders her okay and that's then, another thing about this book is people are witty in a way that's very annoying um and they're not it's because it's tone. not funny it's not witty it's just like the most expected but the delivery of it is supposed to be clever yeah and the other problem is that it doesn't really fit the characters so the, no. in um ninth house there's a similar kind of like snarkiness to it but it fits that book a little bit better because that book is contemporary and also the main character whose name i'm forgetting um she actually kind of comes off as like oh i'm being a little bit like i it, it fits her character more yeah exactly and also it comes off as like a little less i'm cool and a little bit more like i'm trying to be cool but somewhat insecure um, whereas in this one, it just feels like a weird departure from Alina's character. Otherwise, who's otherwise quite like she's very depressed. genuine. Very yeah, depressed. like very, yeah, and it's it, it in general, Alina has a little bit of the problem that she's just too every girl. Um, and in the TV show, she gets away with it because um, the actress who plays her is incredibly cute. But in in the book, it works a little bit less well. Though again, I still liked. I still found myself on Alina's side, and I think it's because there's a lot of good interiority to her character. Yeah. In terms of when things happen, she thinks about them. She processes them in a normal way. Um, like so, she becomes kind of like a saint figurehead later in the book. And and the thing is, we've read books where like something happens and the character doesn't really think about it that much or or react in a realistic way. Um, mm -hmm. And Alina does. And again, there's a lot of small. Um, uh, one of the ways that I think Bardugo is a really good writer is that there's a lot of small elements that she plays into um, and takes advantage of. So like Alina's uncomfortable with her sainthood status. Um, and that's something that in another book, it wouldn't really be like, I'm reminded of Little Thieves. Did you read that one with us? No, I don't think so. Little Thieves was weird because like the book never really acknowledged that the main character was like such a dick and she like murdered someone at one point and never felt bad about it. And that's the thing that happens a lot in these books. The really poor ones is a character will do something kind of like weird and will not actually think about how that plays into the, it's just like a weird split. And instead of like looping back through a character thought to their normal character, it just stays as this weird non sequitur almost emotionally. It's because it's, it's a it's a plot point and not a characterization moment. Yeah. And, and nobody remembers in, in Little Thieves that the main character straight up murder tried to murder somebody that she then becomes her like love interest in. And nobody treats it like a big deal. She is never like, like, oh, my gosh, I tried to kill someone. Like, it's just a weird branch off. And that doesn't happen to Lena, which I think is one of the reasons that she works. There is a continuity of character there. There so, is 100 uh, percent. And she is. Term. 
She is also because now granted we don't get anybody else's internal thoughts or anything, but a lot of the characters seem to have ulterior motives and she doesn't. She just for the love of God wants mm -hmm. just things to just stop and finish whatever like awful evilness is happening and move on with her life. And the thing is, is if we didn't have Mal in the picture, I don't think that that would have been such an annoying point because that gets hammered over your head literally mm -hmm every single page for hundreds of pages it is the most like i hated it i hated it i hated it, it was slogging the whole process of that was awful once they get back to the little palace which is midway through the book um and then like she mal is not there it actually becomes vaguely interesting it's because other things are happening yeah, other things are happening, and we'll get there, but even as other things happen, the core emotional struggle um, that Alina has is with Mel. And actually, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But okay, so one of the first differences is in the um, in the TV show, her and Mal are also in exile, but they decide like, oh, the fold is expanding. We got to go save. Um, we got to go back, and, and it's a decision they make to hunt down the sea worm, which is going to be the second Oh, really? Fire. Yeah, it's a thing they go and decide to do. In that this makes one, so much more sense. In this one, they're immediately captured by the Darkling, who's like, we're going to go find the sea wolf. And it like, was so awful. Yeah, and he, now he has an army of shadow men, the Nichivoya, who are very well animated in the TV show. Um, and and so that's a different, that's again where Alina is very passive she was very passive in the first book where she just kind of went from one person to the next and just did what they were doing and and decided oh on and that happens in the first half of this entire book yeah she's just being dragged around by different people first by um uh the darkling and then later by a character called Sturmhand. Mm -mm -mm. technically by mal because she didn't want to go yeah. into the void uh, uh, not the literal void uh, she didn't want to go off and hide she felt like she wanted to do something else so we have Mal, we have the Darkling, we have Sturmhound, and then we have, like, <laughs> the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then she just hangs out for a really long time. And so Sturmhound is the, or Sturmhound? I don't remember what it Sturmhound. is. Sturmhound. It's like, it's like Germany. It's supposed to sound Sturmhound. Yeah. Um, and so uh, he is the captain of, like, a pirate ship, but a privateer, as he likes to say, um, by the Darkling so that they can hunt down the sea worm. And he is sea like whip. sea whip. The sea, sea whip. Oh, the sea whip, right? Yeah, yeah. He is one of those characters who's like he's like roguish and like one liners a lot. And you're like, uh, it, it's that archetype. And like, it's not the worst version of that I've read. And like, he does develop a little bit as a character, but it's so annoying. William, yes, he's an anime character. <laughs> he totally he is, is. Is he not? I'm sorry. Okay, look, 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 everyone. So, as Will was saying. Um, we have Alina, we have Mal, they get captured instantly by the Darkling. The Darkling um, has one of the Nikivalia uh, bite Alina, which is a really big plot point, um, which I actually liked. Um, and it like creates like this non-healing wound kind of like uh, in Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo's uh, cut from the, um, the Nazgul. Nazgul. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so... They're off on this ship, and they're on it, the privateer ship, Sturmhound. And so he's the captain of the ship, but the Darkling is the one that has, like, bought this service. And so they're off to go find the Sea Whip. One thing I really just don't like about uh, the structure of his crew, right, is we have two mystical Asians. I'm sorry, they're twins. They are not, uh, weren't supposed to be Grisha, but then they were revealed as Grisha, and then, you know, everyone's pretty much like Grisha on the ship. Um, they're pirate Grisha. Yeah, and that does make a lot of sense. Um, but, uh, you know, and then we have this one dude that's uh, like fox-like. I'm sorry, anytime a man is described as fox-like, I'm like, you watched a lot of anime as a kid. That's so funny. Am I wrong? No, it's so it's so totally He's true. He's described yes, exactly described. like a character I would expect to see come out as that third romance option in a reverse. Even harem. the reveal later of his identity is very anime. It's like a, it's like one of those harem dating simulators where you're like, <laughs> oh, you can date that one. I mean, look, you can apply that to a lot of things, but it just, it, it is a lot like that, mm -hmm. and it just comes off as <sighs> the 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 privateer version of him 
was annoying. The Prince version of him was fine. Yeah, it, he becomes less annoying um, once he becomes more roguish Prince, um, which we reveal later. But anyway, so they're on the ship. They're supposed to find the Sea Whip. Th there's a there's a whole thing throughout this book where the Darkling is trying to convince Alina that like, oh, you can't be normal now. The, the muggles will never understand yeah. you. Only I understand you. Um, and he comes to her in visions throughout the book to, to do this. And to me, it never felt like an actual real temptation or conflict no. for her. It just felt very like, like uh, it just, it did not ever feel like the stakes of that were real. Cause it never really felt like she was becoming less human and more, you know, Grisha. Um, I or... desperately wished, you know, okay. <clears throat> There's this point about three-fourths the way through the book. Um, you know the part where she starts getting alienated from Mal even more? Um, and the Darkling starts appearing every day to her? Mm -hmm. During that period of time, I was desperately hoping that he would start talking to her about things. Like mm -hmm. comforting her and giving her advice on like oh, yeah. strategic things. It's because, you know, yeah, like there's this whole big plot point where it's like there everybody's like, you've never led Grisha. And at, at this point yeah. in the book, she begins to she's their commander and that it never comes up again that she doesn't know what she's doing. So I think that was an incredibly weak. Uh, like, why even mention it at that point if you're not going to address it? But um, I thought he she was going to get into situations where she didn't know what to do politically and he was going to inform her. Of what to yeah, do. Yeah, that would have been very interesting. And then she has that point where she's like, am I insane? Is this him or is this hallucination? And then you finally, like, then if that was happening, she'd be like, wait, my mind isn't coming up with this information. Well, and it could have actually forged the bond between them more That's that I mean. she has to realize like, oh, I'm I'm in charge now. I need to make hard decisions. I need to be. And so like, oh, I kind of understand him more now yes. and how he acts. Yeah, I that would have been really interesting. And then I think, honestly, at that point, I think there should have been a building romance. It's because then it gets super convoluted. Mm -hmm. Like, it, there should be, like, some, like, not, like, I want to have sex with you romance, obviously, because he's not physically there. But, like, the intimacy, the trusting nature, the, the it's because I do have to say, the Grisha, uh, not the Grisha, the uh, Darkling does gaslight like a pro. Like, you know, <laughs> he, he, does, yeah, he does, does he not? He gaslights like crazy. And it feels real the way it's being stated. So I feel like that, I kind of wish she went dark side. It would have been, if it had been more tempting for her to go dark side, I would have been interested in it. But yeah. again, in the book itself, like towards the end, she starts having some anger management issues and Mal is being a dick. And for some reason she thinks Mal is like, you know, oh, I can never be with a human. But it's like, no, just Mal is being a dick. Like, calm. like you know what I mean? This is not representative of all of humanity right now. Um, but okay, back to the present. Uh, they're looking for the sea whip. Um, and it ends up that Sturmhund is going to double cross the Darkling. And he like saves. So they go to kill the sea whip and they start to kill it. But then he double crosses the Darkling and they take the sea whip uh, away and run Swip. away from the Darkling. <laughs> sea whip. <laughs> Whip. Sea whip. Uh, like cool whip. Um, I know that entire time I was just like picturing like uh, yeah. the meme. That's all. The meme. That's it. Um, and so this is one of the moments where it's like, okay, and and um Alina is like, okay, should I take the power the second amplifier for myself? Should I take the sea whip's power? Um, and again, the conflict here is unclear. It's unclear what taking more power would do to her. And it's also unclear why Mal is against it. Um, I do have a good reason why. She, now, I don't think that uh, Lee Bardugo actually, funnily enough, I think she laid the ground for this, but didn't connect the pieces in this moment. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole thing that comes up a couple of times in, uh, I don't think the right places, um, where it talks about Grisha theory. And uh, yeah, like, and there's and it is mentioned and there is time spent on it when she is in the first book studying it and she's learning how power needs balance it's like really hardcore there's even a quote she brings up in the second book from one of the uh academics that i thought was really interesting about the idea of you cannot you like you cannot have more than one amplifier amplifier and it doesn't really if i remember correctly if i'm wrong that's fine then it works but if it doesn't come up as i'm remembering it 
when she's looking at the sea whip, there's two things happening that makes her pause. And I like the one more than the lack mm -hmm. of the other, obviously. But I really like the one where she's like, the sea whip was this beautiful creature. And the thing is, is I really like this. She seems to emotionally bond with these creatures. Mm -hmm. She's like, this is a beautiful, wild, magical creature, and we should not be selfishly taking this. It's because they've been here long before us. They should be here long after us kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't directly state that, but that's the vibe you get. And I think that's awesome. That really singles her out from everyone else. She seems a lot more spiritual in that moment than yeah. anyone else. And I really wish that was played off way more. It's because it's not even remotely. Well, and also the idea that comes up in the book a little bit, but is never really explored that there's a difference between the Grisha like elemental bending, they call it small science, and then like a deeper science where you're cre or a deeper magic where you're creating something and that's unnatural and it takes a toll on you. Like the Nichivoya uh, shadow creatures that the Darkling uses are taking a toll on his life in a way that being a Grisha doesn't because he's creating them. Yeah. And so there's something to the idea of like, her killing this natural thing is going to make her less human. And that could have played into the whole idea of that her would have been more so like cool. the darkling. Yeah. See, that's what I mean is that thematically it's unfocused. Like the, the pieces are there, but they don't really connect in any way. Um, and, and so it's kind of just, you're left with a lot of constellation points or a lot of stars, but no constellations. Oh, I really like that. Actually, that's a perfect example. You. Thank you. I'm a, okay, I'm a talented I don't like writer. it that much then. No, take it back. Oh, we need to, it's we need too, to too late. Oh, too late. <laughs> and another place that it's it's unclear is because she does eventually then take the sea whip's power, even though Mal is all like, oh, I don't want you to. I'm not really sure why, but I don't want you to. Like, what if it's too power? Again, his, his, he, he, it's unclear why he's being so bitchy about it. Um, but then they're on the, uh, the ship with the Grisha pirates for a while. Um, and without the darkling because they they long story short pirates slash Sturmhound were like surprise we have another ship destroyed the other ship left darkling on it sailed off into sunset and they're like we're gonna take you back to Ravka because we have a person there that wants to meet you and like you can leave if you want to but also you can't and this is again number two person where Alina is just being dragged off and hauled off to somewhere else outside of her agency which again makes her kind of a passive character but on this ship she's like bonding with the people more than she has with any of the other people in the past and there is a sense of like her becoming part of the crew and that's like nice for her um, but this is what I mean when I say the book is unfocused in that this is interesting but it doesn't play into the themes of the book. It no. doesn't play into, oh, I'm now more comfortable with Grisha than I am with normal humans. Or, you know, That's this is- a good is, point too. Or this is um, a, this is like, for example, oh, this is the temptation to just go off and like, who cares about Ravka, whatever. Um, I want to go do my own thing. And this is the freedom that like this ship could have, but I'm sacrificing that to go to Ravka. That's not, ever talked about in the book. So it's one of these things where she has the moments, but she doesn't connect them in a way that makes sense. Things kind of just happen outside of having an arc to tie them together. Um, and what happens then is as you're reading it, you don't get to experience those really important um, moments that like kind of really hit you that you really want as a reader when you're reading a book. Instead, when you're finished with the book, as someone who's being critical of what you've just read, you're like, oh, looking back on all those things, I see all those things, but they didn't do the thing that they're supposed to do in a good mm -hmm. book. Yeah, no, it's true. It's I, I've talked often about how you can interpolate meaning from a book, but it's not actually in there. And it makes for somewhat of an um, unsustainable uh, reading over time. And this very much has that feel. Yeah. Um, and so basically it ends up that Sturmhound is actually the younger Prince of Ravka. I knew it immediately. I mean, how can you like, okay, look, as soon as in the first book, they were like, oh yeah. And then there's a second younger Prince uh, when she's talking mm -hmm. to like uh, Jenya or whatever. And Jenya's like, oh yeah. And then she calls him nicknamed puppy. And mm -hmm. then, um, and she was like, yeah, he's like really into like mechanics and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, so he's a love interest. <laughs> I don't like, as I don't know what it is, but there's just something about like these like uh, theme, uh, what is it? Uh, like just these themes, like they mm -hmm. are like romantic interest themes. I don't know what it is. It's just, it seems like a category of it. Well, they're like archetypes. 
Thank you. That's the word I was looking for instead of Thanks. themes. Um, but, and um, so when in this book he came up and it was like a pirate and his name was Sturm Hound, I was like, oh, so this is our next romance option. <laughs> <laughs> it pretty much is and because like that's one of the things is he's like look you're the sun summoner i'm the um next i'm, I, the I'm a prince we could be a power couple especially because the grisha are being persecuted a lot now because it's seen as having helped the darkling kill like this whole big town and so it's like oh we could bring them together and she's like uh no mal will be pissy about it um which is true mal is pissy about it um and but that it's is smart <laughs> I'd also I would like I don't even like him that much but you know what I'd rather her with him than Mal at this point the thing about Stromound is that or Nikolai I think is his actual yeah. name mm -hmm. um, is that later in the book he has some interesting moments like there's one part where um, she leaves like a banquet early and he is like yeah. um, he's like oh come on back in don't do this blah 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 and she's like look I'm going home I'm I'm over 30 she's not over 30 that's just mm. probably the most realistic reason to go home early and she looks back at him and she realizes like oh he looks like a child who doesn't want to go hang out like doesn't want to oh what was the because it was a really good turn of phrase but he kind of he looks more like a child who wa doesn't want to go back into the party without yeah. any friends than it, like a prince and like i thought that that's a really nice humanizing moment um, oh it was a beautiful humanizing likeable. moment yeah no 100 percent. that and also he supports her he like he has his own goals and everything, but he also emotionally supports her mm -hmm. and is like intelligent. <laughs> yeah, he's capable, which is like actually quite a nice quality to have. Whereas Mal like is just a, a, a wet towel, a wet towel, a wet napkin. Um, and so they're going through the countryside uh, to the Ravkin capital and they start picking up uh, a a group of pilgrims. Okay, because this country is big into saints, and so because she's a saint, saint because they're Russian, didn't you know? Summoner. That's oh. Uh, by the way, Grisha in uh, Russian is like the diminutive form of Gregory, so it's like all of the mages are called Greg. Greg. <laughs> apparently, it's <laughs> just really funny because it sounds cool in English, but apparently, it's just like everyone is called Greg, um, which is very oh, funny. Greg. Yeah, and so um, we so can't they call they, them Grisha anymore. We have to call them Gregory's. <laughs> Greg's. <laughs> That's really funny, but um, she's now Santa Alina, and she picks up like a following of pilgrims who are following her, and like there's a nice moment where like she thinks someone is calling her name, this merchant, and he's not. He's hawking the wares that might be her finger bones because everyone thinks she's dead, and like parts of a saint are um, you know. Holy. And like, again, that's a nice little detail. Oh, like, that was that great. Not... I loved that scene. See, that right there was so raw. We had the realism of what truly could happen in that situation, mm -hmm. like in a very gross way. When things are more visceral like that, it becomes much more real. And therefore, we have some nice chemistry going on. And it seems like a, like a legit book. Mm -hmm. And there's and it's just a small moment, but it broadens the world so much and it makes her realize like, oh, I'm not really a human to these people. I'm a figurehead. Um, and so it, it's interesting, but the pilgrims start to follow the royal procession back to the capital. And this is a part that's totally missing from the TV show. There's nothing really about her being a saint and that portion of it in the TV show. And I feel like it's kind of a missed opportunity. Um because it is more interesting and honestly more could have been done with it even in the book in terms of like what is it like to be a saint for people what is it to be dehumanized in that way in general there's a lack of grittiness to the book in terms of i, I think of novik a lot because novik is the ah, mm. but so like <laughs> Alina gets to the castle and she's now in charge of the Grisha army, right? And there's a real, and this is like where the status quo is for a lot of the book, for a good half of the book, is just her in the small palace with the Grisha. But there's no like training the Grisha. There's no like interacting with their different personalities to get them to work together. No. There's none of that like little grittiness that Novik always puts in her work that makes the place feel real. And it's actually interesting to see a character struggle with these small things. And in the same way that it's not there with the Grisha, it's not there with her being a figurehead. Um, yeah, it's a, it, the, that's actually a good point. It's, I didn't even think about that because there were so many other things I didn't like. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But we get told that she's organizing, that they socialize and stuff like that. Now, in a way, though, Will, I would say, though, in a way that actually helps. 
uh, characterize her as growing farther away from others. Um, because if she organizes it and she sees it for like a, a, a bird's eye view, which is essentially what happens uh, through like, you know, the moments that go through. Well, you know what could have been interesting is if there was a conflict where she tries to do the whole Grisha thing, but finds it like very difficult and them kind of rejecting her as she tries to actually put into it. And she finds it easier to be the saint who is a passive figure, who all she has to be is a Ooh. figurehead. And so it would be a conflict between like the human, like ugliness of trying to get stuff done with your hands. And then just, I can just be here oh. on, sit here, you know. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. I mean, that would turn her into a very unlikable character though. I think you could do it as like, you know, she's so tired at certain points of just trying to do things that there is that allure of just like, because it, there really should be something where she has to interact more with the pilgrims because they've all just are just hanging out in front of the castle. Um, and that's just, a, it's a very interesting thing that could have been more politically relevant and yeah. would really have given her something to do. Cause again, a lot of what she's doing is just like, having it fights with been, Mal. <laughs> yeah, it would have been really interesting, like you said, to see her go out there and try to make like connections with people. And it's just like you said, a lot easier with them. It's because she's a saint in their eyes mm -hmm. and versus the human version of her. And then she can start empathizing with the Darkling more. And mm -hmm. then she, he could come to her in those quiet moments. And I, you know, honestly, I know Maria's not on this bus, but I am so for them getting together. <laughs> like it's not a good ending and it's not a good book, but I'm so into it because that seems so much more interesting at this point. Well, it's definitely more interesting than Mal. And that's sort of the problem is that I think the author having read this book and the first one and then the Grish, uh, the ninth house is that the author is kind of into bitchy boys. But the problem is that, <laughs> yeah. A, I'm not into bitchy boys, but two, that Mal is the least interesting of the three bitchy boys in that he doesn't have the Darklings like actual dark, you know, uh, whatever the anime trope is. Like he's an actual dark anti-hero with like shadow powers. Um, and so like him being bitchy is more powerful than Mal who's just like, well, I just want you to be my my waifu housewife. Like, just make me dinner. <laughs> like, that's the feeling you get from Mal a lot of the time. And like, that's, so his bitchiness is not earned. Like the show is smart enough to make Mal an entirely different kind of romantic interest where he's very devoted to her. And they have a bit of a, like a, uh, like a, a childhood romance kind of feel to them. Um, even though, again, I find him incredibly derpy in the show. Um, but, but when somebody's that devoted to you, I, but they have no control, but they support you in the things that you must endeavor to do. How can you not love them? Yeah, it's he's more likable in the show, but he's not super likable. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I know Maria really likes him in the show. Um, and the I other just thing think is he's that a poor character. He's a very poor character here. And again, his conflict is just very hard to like care about. And then you have Sturmhound, who's also sort of a slightly romantic hero and that she or a romantic uh object because like they have like tete a tete at times and like banter. Um but and like so he is a cut above Mal because he's actually interesting and doing stuff and isn't being bitchy all the time. So out of the three romantic leads, Mal is the one who's bitchiest without any actual material to back it up and make yeah. him an actual dark hero. And so like, I don't understand why Alina is so, it, it comes off almost a little, not very. Why? I was going to say gaslighty and, and sort yeah, of. It, like does. it does. The dog, it does. The dog is kicked and then comes back kind of feeling to it. But yes. it does feel like that a little bit towards the end where like Alina just has no self-worth. And so she's constantly going after Mal um, and it, it kind of feels like that. And that's kind of a bit of a gross feeling. Mal also, um, so it, 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 there comes a point, right? So Mal, of course, is like head of her guard and uh, her personal guard. And then the two magical Asian twins are also part of it. They are actually really, honestly, they are great characters. I just, I, I've just read a lot about people's feelings about them mm -hmm. by accident. I didn't even mean to. And I was like, okay, I can see why this is like a trope that can be a problem. But nonetheless, the characters are stellar. Um, I actually like them more than the show versions because the show versions are like sassier pirates. But in no, this one, um, they're very the serious. They're very, and also there's the the reveal towards the end that actually they are part of the pilgrims who view Alina as that's a great. 
And that like really broadened the world and made them much more of characters. And I really liked that actually. And I love yeah. that. And it made so much sense because there's breadcrumb trails to that. Um, mm -hmm. it, the, towards the beginning when they're on the ship, the very first time that Alina meets them, they bow to her. Mm -hmm. And they and it's like really weird. And you're like, why did they just show so much reverence? It's because they like stood up for her when she was being kind of like abused, mm -hmm. essentially. And uh, they were like, no, you're not going to do that. But they say it very they're very intimidating. Like even mm -hmm. in the book, they come across as intimidating and cutthroat and like. In a whole other level of intense. <laughs> Yeah, I like that they were they they felt like characters um, who like had lives outside of the, yes. the book a little bit, which is is a hard thing for authors to do. And again, it's a credit to Bardugo that she is able to do that. Um, though again, I get I get the idea that like people don't like the archetype of the magical Asian. Um, yeah, but nonetheless, regardless, taking that away, at least their characters are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, like their characters are the strongest characters in this book to me. Um, yeah, and by the way, Jenya isn't in the fucking book. She's in it for like three seconds, and I yes, was so Jenya is such a fun character. And no, I'm tired of Jenya at this point. I loved her in the first book. No, I still think she's like one of the best characters in the first book. But in this book, I'm like, it's not because of Jenya herself. I see your face. It's not Jenya herself, the character. It's Alina's reaction to Jenya that tires me out. Yeah, and she's also just not in a lot of it. Like, uh, um, she helps. Alina at the beginning a little bit and then is like punished by the darkling and at the end she's been chewed like a piece of bubble gum yeah bits. and I was I was kind of like why didn't that just happen at the beginning of the book or have happened because she helped Alina in the first book like she I, I don't really help her in the first book though yeah I guess not but like when she like she could have gotten eaten by the darkling and then showed up at the Ravkin palace or something like that seemed like I don't really know why that arc had to wait for book three Part of it is I just like Jenya more than almost any of the characters. So if we're I having to why. sit through the Mal being annoying arc, then it would have been nice for her to be around. 100%. But I can see why she utilized it as an under arc. You can't have everybody's stuff happening. at once. Like, I see that. I think that's fine. As a side note, though, David. He's a, <laughs> like, he's a fun character. He's fine, I guess. Like, I, what was the point of bringing him in if Alina wasn't going to bond with him? Um, You know... That that is uh, Katie's husband, actually. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know. He so David is like the nerd with uh, you know the neuro atypical nerd who like can 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 like um, build super cool stuff. And he was the one that Jenya was interested in, but he just like didn't even notice that she was the most gorgeous woman in the world, which is a fun dynamic and like one of the reasons it would have been fun to have Jenya around. But anyway, yeah, and he's like in the book a little Wait, bit. Now that you mention it, yeah. Mm -hmm. That would have been way. Oh my god, I see what you mean. Oh, it would have been way better if she got chewed up, came back really ugly, and then like had that entire time she was there trying and like she couldn't, she wouldn't interact with him. So he has to come out of his shell mm -hmm. to go pursue her. And yeah. I, I mean, I guess if that happens in the third book, kind of like it would here, that's fine. But man, but also, why even mention? I swear to God. Why does Alina not bond with David? Yeah, that is weird. It, it is weird that she doesn't try more. Because again, that at least would have been an arc for her to go on. But again, the stuff with the actual her leading the second army, they're just building some mirrors from what I understand. There's no like, I have to restructure the army. We're going to do this. Like again, Novik does this a lot in her books um, with the like the Temer Temeraire series, like um, in the fifth book victory of eagles which is the best book there's a part where like one of the dragons has to build an army basically from the beginning um and like there's so much small detail about how they're trying to do it and the character conflicts and like that stuff is really interesting and fun to read and it's just and like it doesn't need to be the focus of the book but it really should have been a big element of alina's the stuff she's doing in the castle and also because it's just fun to see characters like build a thing up like that's just I such a, a fundamentally interesting thing it makes them into real people too. It's because you inevitably get to the points where there's going to be conflict or something and seeing how they resolve that conflict is a piece of like telling who they are truly as a character, which makes you decide if you like them or not, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, no, um, we, you only get like, what do I want to say? Like, a, a, like, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's when you get a synopsis of something rather than the whole thing oh, in like a movie. You know, like montage. Montage. Thank you. You get a montage 
instead of any singular moments. And I just don't like so when the characters die because there's a pff, there's a shit ton of characters that die at the end. Um, so when all those characters die at the end, I didn't care. Mm -hmm. They no, just there died. Was, there was one character who died, and I was like, "Oh, that's dark." Uh, it's one of the, the characters that was mentioned at one point was because she was like a girl? side character. Yeah, the yeah. silly girl. Yeah. Um, but like, she was like mentioned a couple times, but it wasn't like Alina had a working relationship with her. Um, and that was, that was annoying. That was like, okay, that could have been done more with. And in general, that is, again, I, we can't even really describe a lot of the middle of the book because it literally is just not her and, and Mal it's have circular arguments about how like he doesn't belong here and he doesn't belong with her. And then she's having visions from the Darkling and then like they make out, but then they have problems again. And Stormhound is like, Mm, and then I'm, Mal's like, oh, I'm really angsty, so I'm going to go Robert Downey Jr. in Sherlock Holmes it and go and uh, bet money on myself and stuff and go fight in fights against Grisha in <laughs> an underground boxing ring. It's and, so funny. That's such a dumb trope that always happens uh, with male characters. And I'm like, there was one TV show it happened where like the guy would under fight and he was like, um, the... Uh, he worked in like a big manor house and i was like so what nobody's punching you in the face like at least in this book like mal has some like bruises on his face every once in a while but yeah. like a lot of times it's done to show that the male character is like cool and dangerous but it's like it's, it's such a tired trope um okay yeah. and so what anyway. basically happens is that there is also this stuff with uh Sturmhound being like he's the second son and the first son is like a prat and not very cool and kind of. I lame. loved him as a I character. Thought he was funny. I thought I would have liked for him to have a little bit more nuance and like for him not to have been a totally bad person just because he likes to race horses. You know, I like, kind of wanted him to fall in love with Alina a little because I wanted him to genuinely like her and think she was amazing, but him still be an absolute idiot and prat. Mm -hmm. I, that's the thing is that the book is, is very black and white with how it treats characters. Um, and, and like the characters are well sketched enough that it's not a massive problem, but it's not as nice as some other ones we've read where like the characters have good and bad points. Like the king is like, you know, abusive to his maids, but like maybe he's smart or maybe he sees the value of the Grisha or no, he's just an idiot old man. That's it. Yeah. And it's, it's very, and so, and like the younger or the older brother is like, you know, I, I could have seen ways where he would have been played a little bit more, um, um, realistically uh, nuanced um like in uprooted uh for viewers who have read that um the prince character in that was like he was a dick but he was like he had really good uh qualities he really loved his mother more than almost anything in the world um he wanted to be a hero but he actually kind of was a hero in ways in terms of like he could lead men effectively and he did sort of want what was best for the kingdom and like that kind of ambiguity um, or at least complexness would have been really nice here. And it could have actually been explored because a lot of what Alina does is like hang out in meetings. Um, and yeah. so like hang out in meetings and like, so when he shows up, like, it's like, oh, <laughs> he can't handle being in meetings all the time because it takes actual work to rule. And I'm like, well, actually, like, maybe that would have been funny as if, like, he is actually better at being really in good meetings at it. than Sturmhound. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Who, like, instead of, like, there there could have been a little bit of, like, that. Or, like, maybe he doesn't want to be in meetings because they're boring, but he's a good-hearted person. Theoretically, he should be better than Sturm, uh, Nikolai. He should be better than Nikolai. It's because Nikolai's not been there. He has not been engaged with anything. Meanwhile... Um, the first, what's his name again? The first son? I don't actually know. Okay. Anyway, he, meanwhile, he's, uh, he's like, I mean, he's buying and selling horses a lot. So he knows a lot about horses, which is actually pretty cool. Um, yeah. but I, I thought that was really a nice bit, but also he's still like schmoozing with all these high end people, these very rich political people. And so he should know like gossip. He should know how people work and tick. He like, uh, if he care if he cares about going, I feel like if he goes to like if, places where there's horse shows and stuff, he likes gossiping. If like, he's a socialite, he should actually know the political landscape in a way that exactly. Stormhound doesn't. And so, like, he could be a useful repository of knowledge. There could actually also be moments where it seems like him and Stormhound are like really Helping brothers, and they're working together yeah. in this moment, even though ultimately there's only can only be one person for the throne. Like, I wanted that so bad. And then that could have been a way for both the brothers to appreciate Alina and her to get closer to a, again, 
uh, people who are above the normal people. So mm-hmm. she's going higher uh, in social like rung. Uh, she's going higher up the social rung and therefore farther away from Mao. Yeah. But yeah, that would have been a really interesting way to do it. But it's like the book doesn't really want to give that complexity to the characters. It's just not interested in it. What it's interested in is it's Mal. Alina Mal. <laughs> yeah, pining after that's like just the fundamentally the problem with the book. Um, and so at the the end of the book comes on pretty sudden. Basically, they get ambushed by at the capital by the Darkling who brings in his army of Nichivoya, and they slaughter all of the Grisha who are on Alina's side. Alina is like, oh shit, we're gonna, this is not gonna be good. I can't fight them. And the Darkling is like, come to my side and I will let all of them live. You know you yeah, want to right. be with me. He's <laughs> lied so many times. How could you possibly believe him? Um, yeah, it's really dumb. And like, she's like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And she kisses Mal and she's like, remember, I love you. And then she goes and tries to use the Darkling's power to basically deplete his battery and kill him. I actually really liked that. And I also yeah. liked the fact that um, she, like, she sell, she does not kiss Mal, actually. She just whispers to him or whatever. And then she goes up to the Darkling and they like hardcore kiss. And the Darkling is like, vindication <laughs> and he like i thought you were gonna say hard on but go ahead oh no and but he basically <laughs> like at that point is like super stoked and so he goes down and ravages her face and then she starts plucking the nietzsche voya out of him like mm-hmm. freaking apples off a tree that's more or less what happens um there's but mal Okay, so she's going to sacrifice herself to kill the Darkling, but then Mal runs in at the last minute and saves her, and they're not able to kill the Darkling. Um, But apparently there are all these tunnels under Ravka, and Mal uh, and her are now being have to be taken care of by the pilgrims. And um, we haven't talked about him, but there's a character who's basically like the Pope. I forget what his name is. Uh, he, He was the spiritual advisor to the king, whatever the name for that is. Yeah. But as a side note, because I did want to mention this, I thought it was really dumb of Alina. Um, like I thought, I thought this was a writing flaw, mm-hmm. uh, not a character flaw in this moment. But Alina in the first book thinks to herself, "Wow, uh, I just can't think of his name." But anyway, this uh, spiritual advisor smells. I, I'm like picturing him like, um, like Rasputin. Yeah, he's very, he's a very Rasputin, like Rasputin. character. Um, and so anyway, she actively notes several times in the first book that he smells like mold and incense. And he smells like old mildewy, like sort of like watery place, like a cave. Mm-hmm. And um, she goes to this particular church where they end up escaping through the cave system. And earlier in the second book, and she's looking for clues for something. And she's in front of this one like icon thing. I forget what the proper name of it is. And she smells like the incense of the church. She, like she, there's an active moment. And I know that Bardugo put it in there so that you, the reader, knew where it would be. Otherwise, why else say it? But Alina should have known as well because she actively, as a character, acknowledged it. She smelled the incense. She smelled the mildew from this one particular place. And Mm -hmm. she doesn't think, oh, (laughs) trapdoor. Like secret secret passageway. I don't, because they're like, how does... Rasputin get in and out of here so easily. How do they get in and out? Yeah, and he's been like disappeared for the whole books, and they're like, Where'd he go? Um, and so apparently, she should have known. Yeah, apparently, there's like a vast underground tunnel because the Darkling has now set himself up as the king of Ravka, um, and ruling with his Nietzsche Voya. Um, and is that how it ends? I, I didn't finish the last 10 minutes. Yeah. And basically, we also find out that like Alina's powers are gone a little bit. She doesn't know if they're going to come back. Her and Mal are like still distant because, of course, they are. Um, And like she's going to have to depend on the the popes and the pilgrims to to um, like uh, to hide her now. And they're going to try to find the third amplifier, I think, still the Phoenix. Um, And so like it is kind of an interesting status quo. But the thing about it is that the Darkling coming in and just immediately raffle stomping everyone feels it it kind of contributes to the problem of Alina feeling passive because all the stuff she did in the middle of the book never went anywhere. It didn't mean anything. All of that, all of the time, all of the effort, all of the focus on these mirrored things that are supposed to amplify her power did nothing. 
it should have made a difference. Like what? Okay. So the way it could have meant something, but not change that much is that mm -hmm. uh, Nikolai and uh, takes the king and queen and they go to run off and they going to this, um, the ship that he built. Uh, it was originally called, oh, it's called the Kingfisher now. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially a flying thing. And so anyway, um, from the top of the little palace, she can see the lake. I don't understand why she didn't see Nikolai and his parents leaving and be like, oh, no, the shadow people are going, the, I'm sorry, the Nichivoya are mm -hmm. going to get them. And then she very quickly used the mirrored plates to rescue him. And therefore, they had a purpose, even if they don't help win the battle. Yeah, it is weird. It is weird that that is not what happens. And again, it's nothing she does. In the, she literally, so the thing is, in the first part of the book, right, where she's hauled around by the Darkling and then she's hauled around by Sturmhound. Now it's like she's now just being hauled around at the end of the book by the events of the Darkling being put in place. It's not like she made any mistakes that were then taken care of. It's just the Darkling comes in and does what he was always going to do. It's not as though like he triumphs because of a mistake she made. Like, oh, I was the one who thought we could trust the Fjordans, but we couldn't because they put an F before a G in their names us um and that's kind of the problem with it it's a bit like you know the empire strikes back it's a very common trope or a very common structural trope for the empire to do well in the second book so it sets up the third book but you know vader doesn't just come out of nowhere he's been chasing them the whole movie and this is a mistake they made by trusting lando they have been escaping up the, to the whole point also a movie is just different than a book in that it's two hours and it's only one of the plot lines so really it's only like 30 minutes of them running and then getting caught. Um, but it kind of, and there's actual growth in terms of the characters and the decisions they make. But in this one, the, the again, the Darkling just shows up, ruffles, ruffles stomps everyone and is like, okay. she She's able to, again, she makes the decision at the end to, to sacrifice herself and, and kill him, which does feel good, but it, it makes the whole middle portion invalid. Like you could literally just skip. That's the problem with it. You could literally just skip everything that happens in the middle portion and it would change nothing about the ending. Yes, exactly. And that's what really sucks is mm -hmm. that it's a whole bunch of wasted space. Um, but anyway, that's the book. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it, the, the second season adapts to pretty much the half halfway through the season. We've reached the end of this book. And I think that's smart because there's a lot less that actually happens in this book than in other books mm. in, in, in um, the like the other book books even. that are surrounding it, like six of crows or whatever it's called. Yeah. I still don't love their inclusion in the show. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Apparently this all happens before their actual plot line in their books. And now they're going to finally get to their plot line in the books. And I'm like, you wasted a lot of character energy in that. I still like the busty hot girl. Um, who's the, the girlfriend of the Nazi. Um, she's a fun I, character. Uh, oh, I know who you're talking about. She was the one that was supposed to get them into the little palace, right? In the show. Yeah, she's like, that's how I remember her. Oh, well, that's not how I remember her. Mm, I just well, remember her. Well, being... your buy card is revoked. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, the only thing I, well, I only met her for five seconds. And uh, all I thought was when she was getting chained up above, below, or chained up like this. Mm -hmm. below the deck with a really hot blonde guy and i remember you mentioning something about a romance and i was like oh is that that <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. it that's all i remember um yeah so overall my my feelings on this book are just very meh like i understand again it's interesting that bardugo gets away with as much as she does and it actually, I think, would be interesting for us to do um, a breakdown of the, her first chapter or her second that chapter. That would be really interesting because I bet you there's a lot of stuff that works, like, line by line. Which she does is this thing where every once in a while she'll pull back into a kind of distant third person talking about the girl and the boy, which are Mal and uh, yeah. Alina. I love those portions. To me, those feel so much cooler and more epic than the which actual moments? book. Like what at the beginning mean? where she's like the girl and the boy hid and the like it's it's kind of oh, distanced and she like does an another omniscient, one at the end. It's an omniscient perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like those. Um, And even again, even in the book, like some of her descriptions are quite nice. Like she talks about she mentioned at one point that Mal's voice was raw as the white inner bark of a tree uh, or something like that. And I was like, oh, that is a really nice turn of phrase. Every time she describes the scales of the sea whip on her and the salt yeah. and the smoothness, like. 
again, she's a great writer um, when it comes to literally the technicalities of writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the structure. And it's interesting because I think that's probably a thing she still has trouble with because in Ninth House, which is like her second to latest book, the structure of that book is a mess. Um, she may get better at them with the different the different Grisha books because after this you have the sequel to this, two Six of Crow books, and I think two more Rule of Wolves and something else. So like, we're not going to go through all of them. Don't worry. Okay. Um, we're going to hold off the third one for this one until the third season comes out. Maybe depends. Uh, Six of Crows will do at some point because everyone agrees that one's better. Oh um, really? Okay. But overall, uh, it's it's a very meh book. I uh, I. It's so weird that this is the one they decide to spend so much money on adapting into like a lot that, of acting. Oh, no, it does not surprise me at even remotely. <laughs> it has all the CW classics. I, it does. It has the the romances, magic. Uh, cool I maintain that world. this would make for a great anime. Uh, this would make a great anime. Uh, mm -hmm. This should never been a real life adaption. Um, the thing is, because anime is just a different medium storytelling like, medium yeah yeah i would have accepted some of the, like the because again when i will watch the show i'm like oh i i like what if i read this in a book i'd be like okay that's fantasy trope whatever but when i'm watching the show i'm like this is so goofy guys yeah and like i'm not someone who's like oh fantasy is lower class like but i'm like this is so goofy do we have no to like for this? example i didn't obviously i did not watch the second season but w there's this one clip in the in the um Trailer, trailer where it's like the darkling coming upon like a, a, a cliffside and it's like the cut and he's like Pts. and it's like <laughs> this slow moving like man array of a darkness thing mm -hmm. and i'm just like <sighs> it just doesn't look good it doesn't mm -hmm. look good yeah and it, and so again i think in an anime this would that would come off as less goofy and like also anime depends less on like facial expressions than live action does and like um some of the other actors yeah some of the acting and some of the the visual storytelling and you know i think it just would fit the genre better but did you guys read this book what do you think of the grisha verse um does bardugo get better as a writer let us know in the comments below yes please do and if there's a book that we don't know of hers that you think is better than all her other books please mention it i'm i would be fascinated why you think that yeah and also um we have a patreon uh <gasps> on this patreon you can get access to our discord which is full of cool sexy people you can get um access to our book our book club live streams where you uh get to interact with us when we talk about the book in these episodes and also you get to choose one of the books each month i think this one's is she who became the sun which should be interesting and um yeah support independent journalism any last thoughts katie no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Sign us out. Later, losers. <laughs>